Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, uh, well, well my, I should say, my lord, ladies and gentlemen. Um, and in some cases, good morning or good evening to those of you who are joining us from uh, a diversity of jurisdictions around the world. A warm welcome to all of you. Uh, and we are delighted to have had such excellent uptake and, and response to this joint uh, HFW, uh, LSLC, and four pump court webinar. I'm Jonathan Webb, one of the shipping and commercial litigation partners at HFW, and I will be your virtual host today. The schedule we have planned is that after some initial words from our chairman, Lord Thomas, we will hand over to the four advertised panelists who will discuss different aspects of the Halliburton decision. As you will be aware, they were all uh, involved in the case uh, on behalf of the LMAA, as was I on a peripheral basis once my partner, George Eddings, retired. Um, the panelists will be followed by some thoughts from uh, Mr. Ian Gaunt, uh, immediate past president of the LMAA, who has been closely involved with the case. Before we move on to a brief Q&A session, thanks for all the excellent uh, questions we have received and continue re to receive, after which Lord Thomas will share his concluding remarks. We are aiming to have the panelists finished by 1 p.m., allowing for a 15 to 20 minute Q&A session followed by the closing. So without further ado, it is my great pleasure um, to uh, introduce you uh, all to uh, our chairman today, um, the, um, <clears throat> the Right Honourable Lord Thomas, who of course served as Lord Chief Justice of England and Wales from 2013 to 2017. Lord Thomas will be well known uh, uh, to many of you joining this webinar, and it is fair to say that um, he is widely regarded as one of the most eminent and respect as jurists uh, jurist in this country over the past 30 years. Um, I, I, we, in the limited time, I, I won't go into great detail, but of course he's a product of Trinity Hall, Cambridge, from where he went to the University of Chicago, uh, could read, the, read for a JD, uh, he was called to the bar in 1969, Gray's Inn, um, and uh, his initial chambers were, was the progenitor of Essex Court Chambers, which he joined in 1972, he became Queen's Counsel in uh, 1984 and uh, a recorder in 1987. In 1992, he was appointed by, to, by the Department of Trade to inquire into the affairs of Mirror Group newspapers. In 1996, he was appointed to the High Court as a judge. Uh, he went on from there to the uh, to the Appeal Court, uh, and he was where he was, and he was uh, senior presiding judge of England and Wales from 2003 to 2006. In 2008, he was appointed Vice President of the Queen's Bench Division, and in 2011, President of the Queen's Bench Division. In 2013, he moved on to his uh, position as Lord Chief Justice, which we all know about, and um, he was president, also President of the European Network of Councils for the Judiciary from 2008 to 2010. Um, between December 2017 and October 2019, he was Chairman of the Commission on Justice in Wales, um, tasked by the Welsh Government into examining the delivery of justice, le uh, justice and legal systems and legal in uh, education in the Principality. Um, uh, and uh, he, he was also a, law, uh, a member of the Law Foundation of New Zealand, a, a, well, a, a distinguished fellow of the, new, of the uh, Law Foundation of New Zealand. Um, I should say that a particular significance also for today's seminar Lord Thomas is uh, is the is president uh, of the LSLC, our co-hosts. And finally, um, I would like to thank Lord Thomas uh, for making time for this event on what is uh, a very busy day to him uh, for him, uh, as he's in heavily engaged with House of Lords uh, business uh, in relation to the UK uh, Internal Market Bill. Uh, so, Lord Thomas, um, thank you very much for joining us, and over to you. Well, thank you very much for that very uh, kind uh, introduction. I will reserve any remarks I wish to make about this case until you've heard from the very distinguished panel, which the uh, <coughs> LSLC, Helman, Fennec and Full Palm Court have put together uh, today. This is a very important judgment and what is remarkable about it, it has 
differentiated between institutional arbitration, such as the ICC and LCIA, and what has been the backbone of London arbitration, the LMAA, and other specialist arbitrations, where, I, where many, many years ago, I first learned about arbitration. So can I therefore uh, introduce this excellent panel uh, as the uh, <coughs> current president of the uh, LCIA, and um, first of all, introduce Andrew Stevens. Now, he's going to start off uh, with a short introduction uh, uh, about the background to the case, but it's important, you know, he's a distinguished uh, young uh, junior uh, at Four Palm Court Chambers, called the bar in 2007, specializes in international arbitration litigation, mainly construction, energy, shipping, and shipbuilding. And of great importance to this seminar, he represented the LMAA in the Supreme Court in this case, led by Nick Vinald. And we therefore look forward very much to his presentation. Many thanks for that kind introduction, uh, Lord Thomas. And thank you to HFW and the LSLC for inviting me to speak. Now, the facts of Halliburton and Chubb are relatively niche. They relate to an ad hoc Bermuda form arbitration to do with insurance. So why does it seem like the whole world of arbitration has caught Halliburtonitis with a rash of articles on the internet about this case? And why does it matter to the world of shipping such that the London Shipping Law Centre is holding this event? Well, in short, it's because the legal tests and duties spelled out by the Court of Appeal and the Supreme Court matter to arbitration generally. And Halliburton Chubb at its core is a case about the rules, rules of general application in English or London seated arbitration that govern arbitrators and that govern specifically what they must disclose to parties and the ability to remove arbitrators for impartiality. These are very important rules for the fair functioning of arbitration. And arbitration matters to shipping and shipping arbitration matters to London and to the evolution of the English common law. So to, to flesh that out a little bit, a significant proportion of global shipping and commodities disputes is resolved through arbitration and through the popularity of LMAA arbitration, a huge proportion of global shipping and commodities disputes are decided in London arbitration. Now, looking at the numbers, the number of London seated LMAA arbitrations commenced each year dwarfs the number of London seated LCIA and ICC arbitrations combined and add to that GAFTA and other ad hoc shipping and commodities arbitration. And one can see how significant shipping and commodities arbitration is to the world of English arbitration. Much of the certainly recent English case on, on shipping and commodities arises out of appeals from London arbitral awards. So in a nutshell, a case of general importance to English arbitration is a case of general importance to shipping and commodities. As a result, the legal principles are perhaps far more relevant than the facts of this case, but it's with the facts of the case that I, I have to start in giving this introduction. The, the very tragic events of the Deepwater Horizon disaster in 2011 gave rise to many disputes, many arbitrations, and to many arbitral appointments, including an arbitration, this arbitration between Halliburton and Chubb, which gave rise to this particular decision of the Supreme Court. This particular issue, this dispute arises from the fact that a well-known and highly respected arbitrator, Mr. Ken Rokerson QC, the third arbitrator appointed by the court in the relevant arbitration, did not disclose to Halliburton that Chubb subsequently appointed uh, Mr. Rokerson in an arbitration between Chubb and Transocean arising out of the same facts. And subsequently, Transocean and another insurer jointly appointed the same arbitrator in a further related arbitration. Uh, Mr. Rokeson did not disclose that either. When Halliburton learnt of this, they asked him to resign. Uh, the arbitrator apologised, explained that his failure to disclose had been inadvertent, but he had, of course, disclosed previous similar appointments before his appointment in this arbitration, and neither party took issue with those uh, other appointments. He offered to resign or to be replaced if the parties could agree on a replacement, they couldn't. And Chubb insisted that he remain in place. So the whole case, all the way to the Supreme Court, was about whether Chubb could insist that the, that arbitrator who was willing to resign could be kept in place in the face of Halliburton's application to have him removed for impartiality under Section 24 of the Arbitration Act 1996. Now, pausing there, 
One might ask why the party spent so much time and money fighting over this very limited issue, almost a, a point of principle, especially where, as Lord Hodge points out in the Supreme Court judgment, in the Bermuda form context before the Supreme Court, both Halliburton and Chubb made repeat appointments in relation to, to, to the disaster. It might be to do with the sums in dispute. The Deepwater Horizon disaster gave rise to many disputes and huge potential liability on the parts of BP, Transocean and Halliburton. Halliburton settled claims against it for $1.1 billion or thereabouts. A short while later, a US court determined that the share of liability between those three parties was BP 67%, Transocean 30%, Halliburton 3%. So Transocean had a liability 10 times greater than Halliburton. Uh, and rough, um, Transocean then settled the claims against it for 212 million. So taking roughly 10% of that, that would suggest um, that Halliburton's liability was around 21.2 million, if that's the correct uh, calculation to apply. So whether or not Halliburton's insurers, Chubb, are liable to pay out in relation to a 1.1 billion settlement is a question worth fighting tooth and nail over. And one might suggest that there will rarely be shipping arbitrations of a similar magnitude. The result at first instance in 2017, then in the Court of Appeal in 2018, and again in the Supreme Court, who heard the case uh, in 2019 and, and delivered judgment in late 2020, was each time on the specific facts of the case, the arbitrator can remain in place. But along the way, the Court of Appeal and the Supreme Court in particular set out a legal test for disclosure, which was new in the Court of Appeal, and the test for apparent bias in arbitration. But note, the case before the Supreme Court was not a case about how many times a party can appoint an arbitrator on unrelated cases without giving rise to apparent bias or conflicts. It wasn't a case about how many times a club or law firm can appoint an arbitrator in that way. It wasn't a case about disclosure of an arbitrator having acted as counsel for a party in an unrelated case. It's not a case about barristers from the same chambers being the arbitrator and counsel in the same arbitration. But the rules arising out of the case are, I would say, relevant to those scenarios. Now, such was the importance of the issues in this case as a matter of, of general arbitration law, the LCIA, the ICC, the LMAA, the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators and GAFTA all got permission to intervene before the Supreme Court. Lord Hodge delivered the main judgment with which three other uh, justices agreed, dismissing the appeal and Lady Arden agreed with the outcome but differed in some of her reasoning. Now, the two specific issues before the Supreme Court were these. Firstly, whether multiple related appointments with only one common party are permissible, or more, more precisely, in what, if any, circumstances may an arbitrator accept two such appointments without thereby giving rise to an appearance of bias? The answer was, it's not per se impermissible, but it depends. Secondly, whether and to what extent the arbitrator may accept such an appointment without disclosure of the position. On that, the Supreme Court adopted a version of the Court of Appeals new test for when disclosure is required as a matter of law and held that applying the usual objective test for apparent bias to these specific facts, the failure, there should have been disclosure, the failure to disclose did not require the removal of the arbitrator. I won't dwell on that too much in this bit because um, Nick Vinyl QC will, will talk about that. But perhaps the most important, in relation to both of those issues and the two legal tests, the Supreme Court held that the culture and precise practices of a, of a field of arbitration uh, have to be taken into account by the notional objective observer. So in essence, the Supreme Court accepted that the international practice of arbitration is not homogenous and different practices in relation to disclosure may properly apply in different fields. The court accepted that, for example, maritime arbitration is less likely to give rise to apparent bias where there are multiple undisclosed related appointments with only one common party, because in that field of arbitration, such appointments are common, accepted and probably also seen as desirable or beneficial by users. On the other hand, say an ICC arbitration where such appointments are uncommon, multiple appointments with only one common party could give rise to such an appearance of bias. And on the specific facts of the case, in a Bermuda form arbitration, uh, disclosure was required and Mr. Rokerson had breached that duty. And still focusing on, on this issue of the culture of arbitration being taken into account, Lord Hodge specifically envisages that, and I quote, 
There will be cases where the custom and practice of the type of arbitration have created expectations which would negative the need for disclosure. There may also be circumstances in which, because of the custom and practice of specialist arbitrators in specific fields such as maritime, sports and commodities, and maybe others, such multiple appointments are a part of the process which is known to and accepted by the participants. That's something worth keeping in mind. In such circumstances, no duty of disclosure would arise. End of quote. So I, I must leave it to the other speakers following me to comment on the implications of this. But I highlight that as a key passage from the judgment. And, and then four further points deserve to be highlighted. First, the test for apparent bias in arbitration remains whether the fair-minded and informed observer, having considered the facts, would conclude that there was a real possibility that the arbitral tribunal or the arbitrator was biased. This is the objective test, not a subjective test, which is what some of the interveners argued for. Second, on disclosure, arbitrators are under a legal duty, first formulated by the Court of Appeal and then tweaked by the Supreme Court, to disclose facts or circumstances which, um, firstly, would cause the fair-minded and informed observer to conclude that there was a real possibility that the arbitrator was biased or that might reasonably cause the objective observer to reach that conclusion. So arbitrators take note of that legal duty. Third, Arbitrators are only required to disclose what they know, but Lord Hodge expressly did not rule out the possibility of circumstances occurring in which an arbitrator would be under a duty to make reasonable inquiries. Fourth, the court found that there may be a certain level of implied consent to disclosure of multiple appointments. But where there's no such express or implied consent, if an arbitrator is required to make a disclosure but cannot do so, the arbitrator will probably have to decline the appointment. Finally, why was he not removed? Well, Lord Hodge held that despite the breach of duty in the circumstances, the fair-minded and informed observer would not infer from the oversight that there was a real possibility of unconscious bias on the part of the arbitrator or grounds for his removal. He gave five reasons for that, but as I've already flagged, Nick Vinyl QC is going to take you through this issue and, and those grounds and no doubt the controversy that has surrounded it. Uh, certainly at the lower levels. So my mission uh, in terms of giving an introduction is accomplished. I've given an overview of the facts and the issues. There's a lot to say about this judgment and the whole issue of, of bias and conflicts in international arbitration. But I will permit myself to say one thing before I hand over. Many of you listening may think, great, so shipping arbitration is exceptional and we don't have to worry about this too much. Well, firstly, I do not think that is right as a general position within LMAA or ad hoc maritime arbitration. There is certainly a lot to think about. Secondly, not all maritime arbitration is conducted under LMAA rules. I've, I've certainly been counsel in front of shipping arbitrators in high value and complex ICC and LCIA shipping arbitrations. So if you're an arbitrator, if you're a lawyer or a user a party in arbitration and you find yourself involved in an LCIA or ICC arbitration, you definitely need to be aware of this overall rule and the differing cultures and practices. And part of that, I flag this up, part of that may well mean all sides, arbitrators and parties keeping detailed records of appointments. But I, I hand over to others to continue the discussion. Well, can I thank you, Andrew, for an extremely succinct uh, summary and also for doing it exactly on time, in fact a little under time. Uh, the true, mar the true uh, characteristic of an excellent uh, advocate. And now we're going to turn to Nick Final QC, who's joint head of Four Pump Court, who had uh, the pleasure and distinction, I think, of representing the a a LMAA uh, in the case. He's got a very broad general commercial practice, the extent of which is I think illustrated by his representation of what's called the Maduro board uh, of the Central Bank of Venezuela in the interesting case that's going on at the moment. He also sits, fortunately for the commercial court as a deputy high court judge. He's going to deal with three points. The summary of the LMAA's argument, uh, the tantalizing question as if the case was to be run again, would the result be the same? And thirdly, he's going to say a little bit about disclosure and how it's driven by fairness. Nick. 
Well, thank you very much, Lord Thomas, for that generous introduction. And thank you to the LSLC and to Jonathan and HFW for organizing the seminar. I'm going to begin with the tantalizing question, in the hope that it is tantalizing. Would the result be the same if this case were to be rerun now on exactly the same facts? And uh, normally the answer to that question will be, well, of course, the result will be the same. But I'm going to suggest that, in fact, if this case were rerun again on the same facts now, the answer might very well turn out differently. And it's an interesting question because quite a lot of surprise has been expressed that the result could be that the arbitrator in this case ought to have disclosed, he didn't disclose, and yet no remedy was appropriate. That seems odd to some people. And so I want to try to tease out why that was the result. Now, part of the reason is that the test for disclosure is applied as of the date on which it said the disclosure ought to have been given. Whereas the Supreme Court has held that the test for apparent bias is applied as of the date of the hearing of the application to remove the arbitrator. I don't want to say too much about that, except to note that that result is not without its oddities for the following reason. If the arbitrator had given disclosure when he ought to have given disclosure, the challenge to his appointment would probably have been made very much earlier. And it might at that point have succeeded. And you may think that it seems slightly odd that the challenge in this case failed because it didn't come to court until a later date, yet the only reason it didn't come to court until a later date was that the disclosure wasn't made when it ought to have been done. But there's a more fundamental reason which explains why not every failure to disclose leads to a disqualification for apparent bias. And to grasp it, we need to focus on the test for disclosure and compare it with the test for apparent bias. And Andrew touched on the test for disclosure is that an arbitrator must disclose information if that information would or might, and that's the important thing to underline, would or might reasonably lead the fair-minded independent observer to conclude there was a real possibility of bias. So there's a sort of double subjunctive in that test, a double contingency. You must disclose something if it merely might lead the observer to include that that was merely a real possibility of bias. So quite a low threshold, you might think. But it obviously follows from the fact that that threshold is fairly low, that there will be many occasions when there is something which must be disclosed, but does not in fact give rise to grounds for disqualification. And so when you go on at a later stage to ask, is there apparent bias, the question is a rather higher hurdle. Would the independent observer conclude that there was a real possibility of bias? So that explains why there can be a, a failure to disclose, which doesn't lead to a conclusion of bias. But there is a complication. Once the arbitrator has failed to disclose something he ought to have disclosed, which of course constitutes a breach of his legal duty, that in and of itself is something which the informed fair-minded observer can take into account in deciding whether there is a real possibility of bias. In other words, the arbitrator makes the position much more difficult by failing to disclose in the first place. And that means that the fair-minded observer can take into account both whatever it is that wasn't disclosed, in this case, involvement in an earlier linked subject matter arbitration, and the very fact of the non-disclosure. And we see that from the Supreme Court judgment at 117 and 118. So you might feel that where there are circumstances which should have been disclosed and they haven't, so that that non-disclosure compounds the problem, there must be quite a high risk that the fair-minded observer would now conclude that there was a real possibility of bias. But the Supreme Court held that on the facts of this case, despite the failure to disclose, the fair-minded observer would not conclude that there was a real possibility of bias. 
And in what is quite a long judgment, they actually deal with the application of the principles to the facts quite briefly at paragraphs 147 to 149. And the first thing they say, or Lord Hodd says, is this, that the Supreme Court seems to have thought that if the question had been considered at or about the time of appointment, the fair-minded observer might well have concluded, that's the word used in the judgment, might well have concluded that there was a real possibility of bias. But they go on, having decided that they must apply the test as things stood when the matter came before Mr. Justice Popplewell, as it then was, when they apply it there, they said, or Todd said he was, quote, not persuaded that the fair-minded independent observer would infer from the oversight of not disclosing that there was a real possibility of bias. And the Supreme Court gave five reasons to support that. I'm not actually going to go through all of them. I'm going to tell you what the first one was. And I think quite frequently when factors are listed, the most important one is put at the top of the list, although the Supreme Court didn't expressly say so. But the first of the reasons the Supreme Court gave for deciding that in fact, there wasn't a real possibility of bias here, was that at the time of the non-disclosure, there appears to have been a lack of clarity in English law as to whether there was a legal duty of disclosure and therefore whether disclosure was needed. And so going back to my question, would this case be decided the same way again? It's obvious, isn't it, that the first factor in the list which caused the Supreme Court to decide that there was not a risk of apparent bias is a factor which could never happen again because we have now all been put straight by the Supreme Court as to what the test is and when disclosure is required. So uh, I, I think those who look at this case and say, oh, the result seems surprising, this sends a bad message about duties of disclosure, are rather missing the point. Because I think uh, standing back as objectively as one can do, there must be a very real risk that if the facts were to be exactly the same in the future, uh, the result would be different because we now all have the benefit of the Supreme Court. Uh, let me say uh, a, a few words about um, the LMAA's uh, position in the proceedings. The ICC intervened and was keen to try to persuade the Supreme Court that elements of arbitration practice particular to its own set of rules, which of course anyone who goes to ICC arbitration has chosen to subscribed to, that some elements of those rules, for instance, a partially subjective test for apparent bias, uh, ought to be adopted more generally. Uh, the LMAA was keen to intervene to make the point that uh, uh, arbitration above all is consensual, uh, that there ought to be party autonomy, and that the starting point is that people contract into rules, which they fancy arbitrating under, uh, subject to the background of the common law position and requirements as to disclosure and as to bias and so on. So the LMAA submitted that the test uh, for uh, apparent bias in arbitration was the same as the common law test, and that was common ground across all the parties. Um, we, uh, uh, of course, the LMA accepted that disclosure should be given where it's arguable or where uh, that matters to be disclosed gave rise to the appearance of bias, just another way of formulating the would or might test. But beyond that, the LMA was keen to say that whether disclosure is required in any particular case is highly context and case specific, and great caution should be exercised before setting down any further guidelines intended to be of universal application. And in particular, we submitted that the mere fact of appointment in overlapping subject matter arbitrations does not in and of itself give rise to any appearance of bias. Um, 
Uh, and we suggested to the Supreme Court that the Supreme Court should be very cautious in promulgating any specific advice or guidance expressed to apply to all types of arbitration because rules and practice uh, differ markedly. And I think it is fair to say that um, insofar as that was the aim of the intervention, um, it was relatively successful because the Supreme Court clearly recognized that there are, if you like, different mores of uh, arbitration and different expectations in different industries and in different styles of uh, uh, arbitration. But one might ask, where does that leave things? In a sense, I think the uh, intervention of the LMA and of GAFTA were successful in uh, avoiding an outcome in which a lot of one size fits all rules were promulgated. But the result of that is that not many specific rules were promulgated. And it's important to remember that because it means that a lot of questions remain open. In particular, as Andrew pointed out, um, the uh, Halliburton case was only about overlapping subject matter arbitrations, so that it tells us really nothing, except in very general terms, about the quite vexed questions of multiple appointments from the same firm of solicitors, or about multiple appointments by the same party, or perhaps by, in effect, the same PI club in non-overlapping arbitrations. And those issues will remain to be dealt with in the light of the general guidance. But I think one point for arbitrators to remember, particularly in maritime arbitration, is that the duty to disclose is an ongoing duty. Uh, appointments are often made very quickly because of, limit, because of limitation periods being about to expire. Uh, maritime arbitration appointments often made with very little information available to the arbitrator at the time when he or she accepts appointment. So, and it may very well be that uh, at the time of appointment, no problems arise with disclosure, but that as the arbitrator learns more about the dispute which he or she is arbitrating, they ought to keep in mind the duty of disclosure. Now, the final point I wanted to touch on was fairness. The Halliburton case was almost totally focused on disclosure driven by concerns about bias. And I have to say, it seems to me important to remember that uh, the tribunal's duty in Section 3 of the Arbitration Act is not only to act impartially, but also to act fairly. So, for instance, I think there may be circumstances in which a tribunal member ought to disclose some previous appointment or previous decision, which is known to one party and not the other, not because it's relevant to partiality, but because it goes to the fairness of the proceedings. Fairness requires a level playing field. When advocates appear before judges, they will, of course, check whether the judge has decided the same or similar points before but both sides are equally able to do that. In arbitration, that's not the case. You can't find out what decisions the arbitrator has made before. And I think there may be some circumstances in which an arbitrator does have a duty to disclose uh, the fact that he perhaps has rendered a decision uh, in relation to a party who appears before him, um, which only one of the parties appearing before him knows about. Um, uh, I think that's enough. There are plenty of questions. I'm now going to stop. Good. Well, thank you very much indeed, Nick, for a very clear and provocative discussion of the case. And we're now going to turn to George Eddings, whom you will all know was uh, the former partner in HFW, head of shipping. Uh, and he has an importance in this case is that he, he, he was instructed by the LMAA to advise on this act, on the application to the Supreme Court. Uh, he, he is now uh, retired as a solicitor and practices as a maritime arbitrator. Uh, George's going to talk about the contrasting approach between uh, <coughs> the various arguments that have been put forward and the differences between the UK and the US view and is going to deal with unconscious bias. George. 
Thank you, Lord Thomas, for the um, introduction. And thank you to the LSLC and to HFW for kindly inviting me along to share this platform. Um, before I start, I'd like to congratulate Nick and Andrew of Council um, for their successful ap um, application and carve out that um, succeeded. And indeed, congratulate also the LMAA in making the decision to intervene in the first place, which is well justified by the result. I think some credit also goes to Clyde & Co as the successful party uh, in winning the case. All credit to Emma Ager and to Michael Payton in sticking to their guns. Um, after all, we've seen by the um, re review of um, how the case went that it was found that uh, Rokeson was in breach. Um, and uh, dis despite that, um, Rokerson offered to resign at, an, uh, at some stage in the case, as was highlighted by Andrew. And despite that, um, that was declined by Chubb. So we've got an interesting decision, and some might say that um, uh, the, the result was won by um, Chubb, perhaps by the skin of their teeth in relation to the findings of fact in relation to the conduct of the arbitrator. The area that I'm going to address you on reflects on the viewpoint of the losers and the three interveners in the camp of international arbitration. And the two areas of submissions in particular that I want to look at are the impartiality of the arbitrators and the subjective allegation of bias. Now, just looking at the background, and with apologies given that um, Andrew has given us an excellent overview, we've recently seen Halliburton appear before the Supreme Court in another case, namely in Enka, where they were involved in a Russian contract and a London basis for the, uh, a, a London seat for the hearing of the arbitration. And here in Chubb, they find themselves with a New York law contract being heard in a London arbitration. And there are tensions that arise from that, as we have seen in this and other cases, not only from the difference of the application of the laws to the contract and the seat and different approaches, but in the context of the Bermuda form at large, there exist tensions as between the assured and the insurer. So the position here is not unique to this case. Now, following the decisions of Popwell at first instant, and the Court of Appeal, there was very vocal support from the international arbitration community in support, not only of Halliburton, but also within US arbitration circles. And remember that the US market is mainly made up in this context of the assureds. So there was a very, as I say, a very vocal uh, group of support for um, the decision of the Court of Appeal being overturned. And this was the backdrop to the interventions by the three international institutions, the LCIA, the ICC, and the Chartered, Arbitration of, Chartered Institute of Arbitrators. Now, submissions from these interveners spoke of the threat to London's reputation as a center for international arbitration. The expression commonly used was the gold stand, London is the gold standard for impartiality, and I saw an article even putting this into the context of Brexit, a very topical subject. So there was huge pressure from the bar, the US bar, and the international arbitration community to reverse the decision and possibly to change the law and align English law within the rules of certain international, uh, international bodies. Now, looking at the result, although um, Halliburton lost, in relation to the supporting submissions made by the international institutions, they were in large part very successful. The Supreme Court upheld, as we have seen, the, the Court of Appeal, that there was a legal and a legal obligation to disclose, and that applied to matters which would or might reasonably might, the emphasis there, get the reasonably give rise to an appearance of bias. Remember, at first instance, that Mr. Justice Popplewell had ruled out a legal obligation to disclose anything which might be relevant, but which turned out not to be. 
But winning this point in the Court of Appeal only got Halliburton so far, because although the Court of Appeal held there existed a legal duty to disclose, which was breached, that in itself could not give rise to a conclusion of unconscious bias. As Hamlin said, something more was required. In appealing against this, Halliburton was strongly supported by the three institutions that I've named, who argued that their rules and guidelines would, would find that the breach of this duty in itself did amount to bias. And their submissions, as Nick has explained, were accepted. The Supreme Court decided that in certain circumstances, failure to disclose without more could give rise to a finding of apparent bias. However, in doing so, and the expression has already been used, the Supreme Court refused to apply a one-size-fits-all test. And they accepted our submissions for the LMAA and those of GAFTA and applied them in relation to other bodies such as international sports arbitration bodies. Plus, as Nick has explained, Halliburton ultimately failed on the facts as applied to Mr. Rokerson. As a matter of law, however, whilst I've highlighted where the international bodies succeeded, they failed also in their submissions in relation to two areas. The first is in relation to impartiality, and the second was in relation to the subjective test that could conceivably have applied. Taking the first of these, impartiality, Halliburton found that they couldn't argue that Mr. Rokerson was actually biased. They had no evidence. They did have rather a go at him in, in, the, pre, in the exchanges which took place between the parties um, when the uh, revelation came out of the later appointment. And they made what Mr. Justice Popperwell termed a grossly offensive suggestion. But they had to accept that he was not actually biased. So dealing with the unconscious question of bias, how do you climb in the soul of the arbitrator, as the Supreme Court put it? And they refused to do so. Now, just pausing there for one moment, one commentator, Louis Flannery QC, who made submissions for the uh, intervention by the LCIA, has complained at the fact that the arbitrator cannot be cross-examined as to his position. So what did Halliburton do in relation to their submissions? Well, I would say they took what might be called a rather US approach to um, the view of arbitration and suggested that there was a, a higher standard of impartiality on the chairman. The problem with this suggestion, however, this submission, is that it seems to accept that there is a lower standard of impartiality on the party appointed arbitrator. And it transpired that the party, that the arbitrator appointed by Halliburton, Professor Park, had been appointed three times before in similar, in cases arising from the same facts. Now, if that is what correctly describe, what I correctly describe as a US approach, it was very firmly rejected by the, Privy, by the Supreme Court. Mr. Justice Popperwell's comments at first instance were very warmly supported by the Supreme Court. So the finding is that all arbitrators are required to be impartial. That's perhaps not a surprise, but that was a point which was made very firmly by the Supreme Court. And of course, the question of impartiality is the root of the bias test itself, which uh, isn't uh, taken out or, or raised particularly in the context of the Arbitration Act. In other words, there's no definition in the Arbitration Act of the test of bias. The second area I just wanted to touch upon was the party perception of bias. Is that relevant? Is it a subjective test? Now Halliburton and the three interveners submitted that the issue of bias should be ass assessed on a subjective basis. The IBA rules say it's relevant if a party thinks that there is bias. 
it speaks of the perception in the eyes of the party complaining. Again, not so, said the Supreme Court, referring to the fair-minded and informed observer. It has to be an objective test, and that is surely right. In this area, on this particular point, the Supreme Court very firmly refused to follow the IBA guidelines, which uh, feed into many of these international institutions. One justification, of course, for this is that if you do um, allow a subjective test, it can give rise to a whole host of unmeritorious applications. And given that it was the High Court which had originally appointed Mr. Rokerson as the, um, the chairman, the desire of Halliburton to replace him was treated as irrelevant. So in conclusion, for me, this is a robust judgment it hasn't gone down very well in international arbitration circles. As I've pointed out, they won successive, successively on appeal to establish a higher duty of disclosure, the MITE test, and the, te the fact that non-disclosure per se might lead to a finding of bias. But they lost on the facts and uh, doubtless due to the reputation of Mr. Rokerson. However, it is also, from the point of view of shipping, definitely a good decision for the LMAA and for shipping arbitrations, where there is a frequency of appointment of a relatively small pool of arbitrators in potentially overlapping cases. And there's plenty of evidence that actually the converse of the submissions by the ICC apply, that that is what the parties to the shipping arbitration actually want and actually push for. So the decision is good for the preservation of the uh, English principles, but the impartiality duty lies on all the arbitrators, including party appointed arbitrators. And it further protects the situation of an oversensitive party uh, somehow being able to derail the arbitration process on the basis of their subjective view. For those who say it was the wrong decision, um, suggest that as a matter of law, it was not. But on the facts, that may be, a, people may take a different issue. Um, and lastly, one post-hearing comment that I have seen has, is that the suggestion that having found that the arbitrator did breach his duty, the suggestion is that the burden should have passed to the arbitrator to convince the court that there was no bias. So thank you for listening. Thank you very, very much indeed, George, Thomas. Uh, George for, for um, uh, a speech which has shown your experience and, and erudition in, in this area. And coming next turn uh, to Cecily, um, who is going, uh, who, Rituka, who is an associate in HFW shipping department and does a lot of in resolution of international commercial disputes. Uh, her claim to be participating is not merely due to the fact she speaks seven languages, something very important in this area, uh, but also she was an important part of the team that had this success. So she's going to talk about party autonomy and the implications of the judgment uh, for arbitration's appointments in London. You're muted. No. Yeah. Here. Can we can we switch and have Ian go next and then come back? Ian, would you mind coming in now while Cecil sorts out the technical uh, problems? Uh, Ian was an uh, was an is an active maritime arbitrator. And he was a president of the uh, LMAA at the time, between 2017 and 2020, and, and provided evidence, which was so important before the Supreme Court. Um, it's going to be very interesting to hear his personal observations, and then we will come back to Cecile uh, in a moment, and hopefully the technical issues will have been sorted. Thank you, Lord Thomas, and uh, thanks to the uh, London Shipping Law Centre and uh, Palmers and Forth 
pump court for uh, letting me have a few minutes to, to talk about this. Um, I should say, first of all, that any views that I express here today are not necessarily official LMAA views, although uh, the views that we put forward in the submissions to the Supreme Court were uh, thoroughly debated by the uh, LMAA committee and uh, did effectively represent the view of at least the majority of LMAA arbitrators. I think the first point to make about this decision is that it is an important vindication of the principle that in international commercial arbitration, uh, one size does not fit all. And this is actually a part of a, a longer running debate, I think, between the, uh, the jurisdictions, as it were, of the institutions to speak for uh, international commercial arbitration as a whole. In effect, uh, a number of the institutions, notably the ICC, but also bodies like uh, ICA and the IBA, have arrogated to themselves the uh, right to make rules of universal application in international commercial arbitration without, in many cases, actually understanding uh, the importance of uh, sectors such as maritime arbitration, which actually as Andrew has pointed out, account for significantly more arbitrations uh, in London and indeed internationally than any individual institution. The LMAA last year had something like 1,600 new cases, uh, which is about the same as the total of the LCIA, the ICC internationally, and the Stockholm Chamber of Commerce put together. So it gives you a little bit of uh, a sense of if you like, the uh, irritation and frustration that is felt by some maritime arbitrators about uh, the way in which they are uh, pushed into the background by uh, in discussions about uh, rules of uh, universal application. Um, we think, of course, that the Supreme Court was right to have decided in the way in which it did and to have largely accepted the submissions of the, um, of the LMAA. But that said, this case, of course, on its facts, is not a sort of case that uh, comes up in maritime arbitration. I can only think of two cases in my experience over 12 years uh, in which uh, a fact situation similar to Halliburton actually arose, uh, that one was dealing with um, multiple fact overlapping fact situations. One, of course, was the celebrated O.W. Bunker case, but those are very, very rare. The sort of cases where these types of principles come into play are chains of arbitration, which are not uncommon, and where, generally speaking, the uh, parties involved and their solicitors try very hard to make sure that the same tribunals actually hear each stage of the arbitration to maintain uh, consistency throughout the chain. Uh, another is cargo claims, where the same ship owner may face many uh, claims by separate uh, owners of parcels of cargo under different bills of lading. Uh, we've heard about the small, small pool of arbitrators. That is true to a certain degree, but um, the choice of arbitrators is available to uh, the parties in maritime arbitration in London. And we can overemphasize the smallness of the pool. There are 30 full members of the LMAA. There are 30 aspiring full members of the LMAA to whom we have given some degree of, uh, of acceptability, perhaps put it that way. There are at least five sets of barristers' chambers who specialize in maritime arbitration from whom appointments can and are, are made. So this pool is not necessarily as small as the pool of Mr. Guyard and Mr. Paulson and some of the other so-called gods of our international arbitration in the so-called international commercial arbitration sphere. And speaking of independence, when it comes to, um, to the appointment of arbitrators in so-called international commercial arbitration, I think it's quite interesting to read from the judgment of Lord Hodge, uh, a citation from a comment which was plucked from uh, an article by Professor Martin Hunter, in Ethics of International Arbitrator ASA Bulletin, in which the author draws a distinction between impartiality and neutrality and coming from an international commercial arbitration and no doubt institutional background, where he said, 
Indeed, when I'm representing a client in arbitration, what I am really looking for in a party nominated arbitrator is someone with the maximum predisposition toward my client, but with the minimum appearance of bias. Now that's, that's why probably we have guidelines like the IBA guidelines, because if that is the practice in international commercial arbitration, then it certainly needs some sort of regulation. And um, I think I can say with my hand on my heart, in 12 years of sitting as an LMA arbitrator, I have not encountered that attitude in LMA arbitration at all. It used to be the case. Many people who are slightly longer in the tooth than I am will remember the days of Cedric Barclay and uh, uh, Dickie Clyde and so on and so forth, and the idea that someone was an owner's man rather than a charterer's man. But I can honestly say that in my experience, that is no longer the case. There are criticisms that can be made of disclosure in LMA arbitration, and the LMAA will be looking very closely at the judgment in conjunction with Messrs. Vinyl and Stevens to decide what, if any, changes we need to make to our rules and indeed to our code of ethics. Uh, but I see this, this judgment indeed of a vindication of the approach of the LMAA in this situation uh, and a recognition of indeed the importance of the LMAA and its arbitrations in London and in the wider uh, commercial world. So thanks very much for giving me the opportunity to express those views. Uh, you're muted, I'm afraid, Lord Thomas. Lord Thomas, you're on mute. I was going to say thank you very, very much indeed for uh, coming in and speaking uh, and giving us such wisdom. And now can we try again to see if, uh, like I was a moment ago, uh, Cecilie is able to give us the benefit of her final remarks. Um, thank you, Lord Thomas. Is that um, any better now? Yes, fine. Off you very go. Good. Thank you very much, and um, apologies for the uh, for the technical issues. Um, a special thanks to the LSLC also for, for having us today. I would like to address an aspect arising from Halliburton and Chubb, which has gone largely unnoticed, but which I think is very important in arbitrator appointments in the shipping context, and that is the concept of party autonomy. Historically, shipping disputes were referred to leading shipbrokers for determination. Parties valued their knowledge and their experience, as well as the informality, confidentiality, and fast turnaround. Nowadays, shipping disputes continue to be resolved in ad hoc arbitration, although the process has a much greater legal element to it. To put matters into context, according to our research at HFW, around 80% of all international maritime arbitrations globally are resolved on LMAA terms. Arbitration clauses in shipping contracts give parties the express right to each appoint that arbitrator at which the party subjectively thinks will be suitable to determine the dispute. The agreement may also qualify the party's freedom of choice further and demand that the arbitrators shall fulfill particular criteria relating to their expertise, particular membership or specific profession. The level of disclosure of arbitrators has received recently a lot of attention, but it is worth emphasizing that in the shipping context, parties do not tend to provide more than that in their contracts. They do not specify a maximum number of appointments or impose any qualifications as to appointments and overlapping arbitrations. The question then is, to what extent should the law or, or applicable procedural rules qualify such agreement further by default. Higher disclosure standards mean more potential interference with the party's right to nominate that arbitrator, which the party wants, a dis wants um, to resolve a dispute, um, and that goes against party autonomy. In Halliburton, the court was mindful of this consequence. It has therefore endorsed a nuanced approach which upholds party autonomy. And thanks to the intervention of the LMAA, it is now very clear that the characteristics of London maritime arbitration are unique and distinct from those of international commercial arbitration, as are the resulting disclosure obligations. 
flexible appointments of arbitrators at short notice, uh, regular multiple appointments, including multiple appointments with an overlap, and appointments in string arbitrations are common features. Conversely, if the parties have any concerns about any aspects of appointments, they are free to provide so in their contracts without any universal application, party autonomy preserved. In practice, um, parties may often be quick to jump to conclusions um, that an arbitrator is biased um, on the basis of the other party's appointment. However, this disregards three important aspects. Firstly, any party making such an allegation will also have exercised the same right and selected an arbitrator um, which, in, which it considers suitable uh, to resolve the dispute to the tribunal. But the grass will always be greener on the other side. Secondly, the right to select and appoint an arbitrator is a leeway that the contract expressly permits each party to have. The parties can choose whether and how they want to use it, and this may well be a strategic choice. Parties must be free to appoint an arbitrator because the individual has a particular background or expertise, is efficient or particularly proactive. Finally, an aspect which has received little mention is the fact that normally there is not one biased arbitrator determining the disputes as commentators like to portray it, but two and ultimately three arbitrators which make up the tribunal. So it is the very appointment mechanism that plays an important role in striking a balance between party autonomy and ensuring that a fair decision is ultimately reached. It is perhaps against the background of the uncertainty of the Court of Appeal decision in Halliburton that we as shipping solicitors have been seeing emails from arbitrators making increased disclosure when accepting appointments. I have to emphasize though that these have come from only about a handful of arbitrators. On most occasions, arbitrators disclose three subject matters, the number of appointments by a law firm, the number of appointments by the appointing party, and the general category of disputes in previous appointments. Disclosure occurred over a period of around three years, loosely following the IBA guidelines. On some occasions, these figures were accompanied by the explanation that multiple appointments, including those with an overlapping subject or contractual matter, were common in London maritime arbitrations. And it is one thing to provide figures, but another to convey information using these figures. And I would like to make a few observations about these disclosures uh, from a post Halliburton point of view. Firstly, the amount of appointments over a period of time does not allow any meaningful conclusions to be drawn from such figures without the information as to their share or the overall number of appointments. 10 appointments out of 100 is fundamentally different from 10 appointments out of 20. Or does that say anything about the proportion of an arbitrator's revenue that arbitration work accounts for? This is highly individual. Um, secondly, disclosing the number of appointments by a legal advisor does not explain whether the appointments have come from a single source or whether they were spread across the firm and came from individuals who may not even know each other. Most importantly, however, it disregards the fact that appointments are made on behalf of a party to a dispute. Um, and it will be that party most of the time that will, be, that will be responsible for the payment of an arbitrator's fees. The party's selection of external representatives should also not have to impact on uh, what arbitrators um, a party may appoint. And finally, a few words on multiple appointments. I think yes. I think we'd better stop now because otherwise we're going to run out of time for questions. And they and if someone's interested, I'm sorry to interrupt, but Jonathan, if I can ask Jonathan Webb now to ask the first question that has arisen. You're on mute. Beg your pardon. Okay. Um uh, thank you, Lord Thomas. I was just saying we've got an, a, a fantastic selection of questions. Thank you for everyone who's contributed. They're still coming in. Um, so we've got many more questions, I'm afraid, than we're going to be able to put. But 
here we go uh, with the first one. Um, to what extent did the decision not to remove the arbitrator uh, in the Halliburton case turn on the reputation of that arbitrator? Would a less well-known, less experienced or le less experienced or less respected arbitrator have been removed by the lower courts or indeed the Court of Appeal and ultimately the Supreme Court? Um, any, any of the panelists particularly want to have a, a bite at that one? Andrew has got his hand up. Fine. Andrew. Oh, very oh, quick. You, Lord Thomas. So, very good question. Um, uh, at first instance, in the early decisions in the Court of Appeal, uh, the reputation of the arbitrator was a factor that was mentioned. That was quite controversial. One of the points being made about that was that what about users of London arbitration who are first time flyers or don't know the arbitrators that well? Uh, doesn't it, people said, make it seem cliquey, uh, like an old school club? Um, and for, for foreign inexperienced users, that does not seem fair, was the criticism made. Lord Hodge deals with this in two ways, I think. One, uh, overtly, um, that is at paragraph 67, uh, he recognises this point that some users may not know of the reputation of an, arbit of an arbitrator, but he says reputation can be relevant to an objective observer, but he says it's likely only to be of limited weight. But then at the business end of, of the case, when, when looking at whether Mr. Rokerson should be removed or not, it doesn't feature in the Supreme, Supreme Court reasoning or, or, or not overtly anyway. I think where it may be relevant, but, but not expressly, is that the, the fifth factor that the Supreme Court listed was um, that there's no subconscious bias because Mr. Rokerson dealt with the challenge courteously uh, in a temperate way and in a fair way. And I think that's a, a mark of Mr. Rokerson's experience and reputation that he reacted in that way. Um, Andrew, don't spoil your reputation with long answers. We've got, to get, we've got okay. about 20 questions. Let's try a couple more. Right. Um, this one, thank you, Lord Thomas. This one from uh, James Clanchy, a former colleague of ours at HFW and now an arbitrator. Um, on going back to last year, uh, he says, he quotes, on 23rd November 2019, 10 days after the hearing, the ICC issued a press release in which it reported that the Supreme Court had sent in underscoring the ICC, uh, the, um, the ICC court's standing as the global benchmark for international arbitration standards. It went on to say that its, its intervention reaffirmed its role as the trusted standard setter in international arbitration. And what James asks is, does the panel agree with the ICC's assessment of its standing and influence? Who would like to take that? Ian, Nick, sounds like one for one of you. Uh, so um, I'm quite happy to take that, but uh, I can deal with that really quite briefly because it, it is an extension of what I said before. I think it shows a certain arrogance on the part of the ICC. They think that they can uh, dictate the, uh, the, the rules for international arbitration. The ICC is not the only game in town. And um, whilst its rules de definitely deserve respect, as uh, is clear from the number of arbitrations that they handle, they have to accept, I think, that there are many, many other forms of arbitration. For example, in, in the shipping world, those who are confronted with an ICC arbitration clause, in many cases, the only thing that they can agree on when a dispute has arisen is that they ditch the ICC arbitration clause and put in an ad hoc uh, provision for LMA arbitration instead. ICC arbitration is not popular in the maritime field, and, mm -hmm. and frankly, from my experience, for very good reason. So uh, I'll leave it at that. Okay. Okay, next question. Okay, uh, this one from uh, Rebecca Warder. Um, um, while the Halliburton case didn't discuss financial benefits in any detail, um, as it was established, there was no question of financial benefit in this. Other cases such as uh, uh, Coffee versus Bingham have established that there can be apparent bias where one particular party's appointment, appointments form a large part of a particular mm -hmm. arbitrator's caseload. 
in the in the Coffey case, uh, eighteen percent of the arbitrator's appointments were from the party in question. Would the panel agree that maritime arbitrators should be conscious of the financial benefit question in considering whether to accept multiple repeat appointments? Who would who would like to take that one? Cecily. Thank you. Um, so that, yes, thank you, Jonathan. <laughs> Jonathan, that ties in very well with uh, what we were saying um, previously. So um, we do have um, some guidance from the Supreme Court now, which is which is very helpful. So um, the question will be: Is uh, would or might a matter reasonably cause uh, an objective observer to conclude that there that there is bias? Um, uh, or, or a reasonably a reasonable possibility that there um, that the arbitrator is biased, um, and obviously the the um, objective um, observer will have all the knowledge of um, what London maritime arbitration is all about in mind. Now, obviously, um, there is a bit of uncertainty. Some arbitrators interpret their obligation um, differently from from others. Um, so, uh, hopefully, there will be some uh, guidance from the LMA forthcoming. And in so issuing that guidance, it is very much hoped that in the same way that the Supreme Court um, paid its respects and um, uh, to uh, um, uh, basically the, the, the fact that um, party autonomy should prevail, the LMAA will do so in any uh, changes or any guidance that it issues. Thank you very much. One, I think we've got time for one more, uh, Jonathan. Right. Um... Given the relatively, this is um, from uh, uh, Ru Ruth Allen uh, de Donado at HFW, um, given uh, the relatively limited pool of LMA uh, specialist maritime or trade arbitrators, if arbitrators take a more cautious approach to accepting appointments, particularly given the fine balance between confidentiality and transparency, can parties be reassured that they won't be impacted by delays in proceedings or other logistical challenges due to lack of arbitrator availability? Anyone want to bite on that? Nick, you haven't taken a question or? <clears throat> Anyone else? Well, I, I would like to say something about that because- Okay, Jan, sorry. Um, first of all, as to the relatively small pool, Part of the problem stems from the extreme conservatism of the appointers, um, that it's, they always tend to go for the same people. We have done our best by establishing a pool of aspiring full, um, uh, full member um, arbitrators to encourage uh, appointors, including PNI clubs, to broaden the uh, scope of appointments and uh, it is as much up to the parties as it is up to the individual arbitrators to attempt to spread the, uh, the, the, the load more widely. There are, as I say, at least 60 maritime arbitrators in London. Uh, there are members of the bar who are prepared, prepared to take arbitration appointments. So the pool is not that small, um, uh, even if it is a specialist um, sector. In terms of time taken, I think it is up to an arbitrator to make sure that they do not take on more appointments than they, they can handle. That They actually think about the time uh, that they have available. The problem is that when you accept an appointment, you don't necessarily know how the case is going to develop. Uh, you don't know how much time it's going to, to take up. And you don't know whether it's going to coincide with any number of other cases that you're, you're handling. So it is um, a judgment that's got to be made. Um, at, at the outset, but the point I made earlier about spreading the the, the load more widely is is uh, one which I think really needs to be taken on board by by appointing parties. And Jonathan, can I Thank just? Thank you add... very, very much. Um, Sorry, to, who's going to add? Sorry, it's George. Um, I just wanted to add one further point in relation to that, which is that um, because of the carve out that has been ruled by the Supreme Court, the chances of um, uh, challenges to the impartiality of um, LMAA arbitrators has been diminished. I mean, I'm not ruling it out. It, will, it, it, it may happen and we can all think of circumstances where it could happen, um, but it's not just the pool. It's, it's the fact of the, um, how the, the decision was handed down. Can I just say one, one final thing that I agree with everything um, Ian said. Fundamentally, in, in this area of 
competence of arbitrators and potential grounds for a criticism of the bias. One has to find a sweet spot. You could take the view, which some uh, institutions seem to take, that the safe course in a shipbuilding arbitration to avoid any conceivable possibility of bias is to appoint an arbitrator who has no previous knowledge of shipbuilding, has never had any contact with any shipping firm, knows nothing about English law and doesn't know what a class society is. If you do that, you can be absolutely certain nobody will be accusing them of bias. But the problem is they will have not the foggiest idea of how to approach the issue which they're asked to resolve. Well, can I thank uh, everyone? I think we're now running to the time uh, where people were told they had an hour and a quarter for this and we have got there. Yeah. And I wanted to say three things. First of all, thank you very much to everyone for coming. It's been a wonderful, um, uh, a wonderful uh, uh, after, uh, afternoon or lunchtime or evening or early morning, wherever you may be. The decision of the Supreme Court is clear. I very much hope it won't give rise to further litigation. But what is important, I think, as has been underlined in some of the comments, is that it is vindicated that one size does not fit all for arbitration. Sometimes I think people forget the whole point of arbitration is to help the parties, uh, not anyone else. And I think in acknowledging the singular service that specialist arbitration does in London, the LMAA, GAFTA, reinsurance arbitration, and the like, uh, the, the Supreme Court has reminded people that there are values in a, in a form of arbitration which may not conform to the vast institutional arbitrations. Each is good in itself, but has a different purpose. Normally also, when one advises on disclosure, you always say, well, disclose, there's no harm in it. But, arbit <clears throat> but arbitration is different because of the obligation of confidentiality. A and the way in which the specialist markets have behaved has a slightly different inclination for dealing with confidentiality and for being able to promulgate very important points of practice uh, across the industry. So I hope the decision uh, will strengthen uh, London maritime arbitration, strengthen the specialist uh, arbitrations in London, as well as satisfying the institutions uh, that England is still a very good place in which to arbitrate. But can I finally, as uh, president of the London Shipping Law uh, Centre, thank all of the contributors uh, particularly uh, uh, Ian Gaunt and John Eddings, as arbitrators bring their perspective, uh, 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 Seal and Jonathan Webb from uh, HFW for doing all they have done, and the star and their assistants behind the scenes who put this on, a and finally uh, to come the council who were so successful in, in this case. It's been a very great pleasure to have chaired it, and I hope it will for the future strengthen London our arbitration very considerably. And now I'm going to hand finally to Jonathan Webb. Uh, Lord Thomas, thank you for that uh, very succinct, excellent summary with respect. Um, uh, and uh, we go away with the thought that this judgment maybe can not face in two directions, but as you say, uh, can satisfy global market as to uh, uh, impartiality being axiomatic, as Lord Hodge put it, to what we do here in London but also uh, protecting the specific sector focused um, arbitration uh, uh, fora that thrive here uh, with their own special needs and rules. So thank you very much. I will simply piggyback on the thank yous that, that you've already expressed. I, I can't add anything to that. Uh, um, thanks to our partners in LSLC um, and to everyone involved. And finally, Lord, uh, uh, Lord Thomas, thank you very much to you for, as I say, making time in a busy day. That's it, everyone. Thank you also to uh, the participants joining from all over the world uh, um, and for your questions. Um, we have to wrap it up now, but please do, uh, you know, please do feel to liaise with, uh, you know, anyone on the panel or any, you know, by email or whatever, if you have any further queries. Um, and that's it. It remains to wish everyone, I think, a, a, an excellent Christmas and a, a happy new year, which will hopefully be uh, better than this year. Thank you.
Thank you very much, everyone.